Um, happy Disability Pride Month, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening um, at the first online disability resource fair. Uh, thank you to our panelists for being here and thank you to the attendees for joining. The Northampton Disability Commission is really excited uh, to host this event in an effort to support people with disabilities and their families and friends. We know that learning about all the various organizations and support services in the area can be a huge job unto itself, but can also be transformative. Having support systems and adaptive adventures in place as known entities can offer foundational undergirding in our lives and can help lower our stress. The Northampton Disability Commission's hope is that this resource fair with 11 entities represented is a beginning or an expansion of supportive and uplifting havens for people in the disability community, along with family and friends. We'll hear from a few recreation organizations. We'll learn about resources from a couple of educational supports. And then along with Triad, Stavros, Forbes Library, the Disability Law Center, the Architectural Access Board, and finish with learning about Northampton's ADA transition plan. A special thank you to Disability Commission member, Kathy Murray, who orchestrated the bulk of this organizing to, to make this happen, along with Councillor Jeremy Dubbs, who is our liaison to the city council, and local resident Jacob Drew. An extra shout out to Jacob for this idea. Thank you to Keith Benoit, ADA coordinator, who's hosting the meeting and has done um, a lot of background work to support this event. So just a minute, um, a little bit about the Disability Commission. We are comprised of nine commissioners and we meet monthly, except for August on the second Tuesday of each month at 4 p.m. on Zoom. The link and the agenda can be found on the city's website on the Disability Commission page, and the public is encouraged to attend. There's a public comment time at the beginning of each meeting, and if you have questions or concerns related to disabilities, you are welcome to share those during that time. A recording of this meeting will be found on the city's uh, webpage for future use and viewing. Um, so what does the Disability Commission do? We have the purview to address local issues affecting people with disabilities, advise municipal officials on compliance with state and federal laws, coordinate programs with the Massachusetts Office on disability, work with the city to encourage maximum participation of people with disabilities, review city policies, services, and facilities for accessibility, encourage public awareness of disability issues, provide information, referrals, and technical assistance in all matters pertaining to disability, and coordinate with local groups with similar goals. So again, thank you so much for being here this evening. I hope you learn something new and find a new resource that supports you or your family or friend. Without further ado, I'll pass the, the mic uh, remotely to Councillor Jeremy Dubbs, who will introduce each of the panelists, help keep us on time, and facilitate the question and answer segment. Thank you, Councillor Dubbs. Thank you so much, Amy, and thanks for everybody for being here. Uh, we're very, like Amy said, uh, we're very excited about this event, and um, and so without further ado, I guess we'll, we'll get started. Um, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Jeremy Dubbs. I'm the city councilor in Ward 4 here in Northampton, and um, before I was city councilor, I was on the 
the chair of the Disability Commission um, since 2019, I believe. Um, okay, and so we'll get started with um, our first presenter, Karen Foster from All Out Adventures, outdoor recreation for people of all abilities. Thank you, Councillor Dabbs. And, and um, Amy, I really loved what you said at the beginning of the meeting, um, and I'm excited that this is happening tonight. I appreciate you all bearing with me. I'm at a kid baseball game, um, so excuse any background noise. Um, and yeah, as, as um, Councillor Dubs said, I'm the executive director of All Out Adventures. We're a nonprofit based right here in Northampton. Uh, we're on Pleasant Street. We run outdoor recreation programs for people who have disabilities and their loved ones, um, and their family and friends. And I'll just share a little bit about the programs and then invite you to um, visit us either at our website um, or call us and I'll make sure you have our contact information if you'd like more information. Um, Keith, if you could go to the next slide. And just for an overview, um, the programs we offer are accessible to people of all ages and all abilities, including those with disabilities. About half of our program participants have disabilities. The remaining half are um, family, friends, caregivers, loved ones. Um, so we're looking at a photo right now of a gentleman riding a hand cycle. It's on the Ashawiltico Rail Trail out in the Berkshires. And I just wanted to share the programs we offer, um, ranges from cycling, kayaking, canoeing, stand-up paddleboarding, hiking, uh, ice skating, sled skating, cross-country skiing, sit cross-country skiing, kick sledding, uh, snowshoeing, and our newest program is Adaptive Pickleball. Um, Keith, you could go to the next slide. And our program umbrella really includes, um, you know, sort of three different overarching programs. The one people most know us for is the Department of Conservation and Recreation's Universal Access Program. That's a program we run in partnership with the state park system that's funded by the state parks. Um, and those programs are open to people who have disabilities and their loved ones. And our participation fees for those programs range from five to $8. We also have a contract with the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission Statewide Head Injury Program where we run programs for people who are living with acquired or traumatic brain injuries um, and their loved ones. Um, for all of those programs, it's $5 to participate. Um, through the Federal Veterans Adaptive Sports Grant, we have programs for veterans and disabled members of the armed forces with no participation fee. Um, and then through our individual contributions, fundraising events, um, and, and the other work that we do, we offer programs for seniors. Um, they're on a sliding scale of 5 to $20. Uh, Keith, if you could go to the next slide. And I just want to like take a second to highlight our staff. Our programs are run by a um, combination of program leaders and assistants who take their jobs really seriously. Um, we practice, we train, um, we're able to assist um, with transfers, um, you know, with situations that can come up in our programs. Um, and we've had uh, staff with us uh, for anywhere from this is their first season, um, to our program director and I have been um, with the organization since 2004, 2006. Um, we're program leaders seven, eight years. So our, we have pretty long-term, really dedicated, compassionate staff. Okay, if you could go to the next slide. I just wanted to show a little bit our kayaking. Um, this is our, our uh, we offer kayaking on the Connecticut River in Northampton at the DAR State Forest in Goshen. Um, and then, you know, across the state, out in Hopkinton, um, and out in the Berkshires, and in Worcester as well. Keith, okay, you could go to the next slide. And a, an overarching question people often have about kayaking is how am I going to get in and out of a kayak? We have a million tips and tricks. I just wanted to show you one um, where a wheelchair user can transfer into a kayak on shore um, that we push on these big balloon wheels, and then we can float the kayak into the water pop the wheels off, and then off they go. Um, so there's there's a million different ways. That's just one of them. Uh, Keith, you can go to the next slide. And uh, our cycling is one that people often, um, you know, know us for. They see us over in Hadley on the rail trail. Um, we also go out to the Berkshires for cycling, um, out to Central Mass in Worcester and Blackstone, out to Eastern Mass um, in Brighton. Um, and we have trikes for all abilities. Um, we're looking at one trike where we can wheel a wheelchair right onto a platform and transport it. We're looking at someone using a hand cycle from the back. And then there's a big group photo that shows people on recumbent trikes, uh, tandem recumbent trike, uh, electric assist recumbent trikes, 
um, you know, kind of everything um, to be able to get out and enjoy. Okay, you can go to the next one. We also um, offer some hiking. So we're looking at a photo um, of a gentleman using a hiking wheelchair, um, posing um, at a platform at DAR with his wife. And we also are looking at a, a, a couple of people using a rugged walker um, that can go over rocks and roots and things like that to make hiking accessible. Next slide, Keith. Um, stand up paddle boarding is one people often question the accessibility. So I wanted to show this. Um, one, we're looking at a photo of seniors stand up paddle boarding. And what I think is important to note is that you can use a paddle board sitting down or standing. And if we fall off a paddle board, we fall into water and it doesn't hurt. Um, so paddle boarding is an incredibly accessible activity. The other photo we're looking at um, is our board president, Philippe. Um, he's using a paddle board that has a seat that can also be converted into a leaning prop and has outriggers. Um, so it's a way that we can make paddle boarding accessible to people with balance concerns, wheelchair users, um, really everybody. Um, next slide, please. Um, ice skating is another one that um, people don't always realize just how accessible it is, but we're looking at um, a boy skating with a balancing aid. Um, there's people using sled skates um, where they're seated. Some are pushing themselves independently. Others are being pushed by a stand skater. And we're also looking at a photo of a gentleman who is blind um, as, a, as an impact of his brain injury um, and skating around circles on the rink um, with assistance. Um, so we can really accommodate um, you know, all variety of, of needs at our skating programs. Next slide, please. Um, and then I wanted to, on this like really crazy hot day, think about winter um, and show just again, um, this is a, a young woman using a rugged off-road uh, wheelchair. Next slide, Keith. And then these are, I'd mentioned kick sliding at the beginning. Um, these are different mobility devices we can use on snow. Uh, we're looking at a young man um, who's seated on a kick sled um, and his mother can push him. Um, here she's leaning over, kissing his cheek, um, but the, it glides across snow almost uh, like a wheelchair. Um, there's a group photo of people standing and pushing kick sleds, and there they can use be used for balance, almost like a walker that goes over snow. Next slide, Keith. And then our newest program is Pickleball, um, which we do with a variety of adaptations. We have um, wheelchairs, they're, they're tennis wheelchairs, they're really sporty and fast and fun um, for pickleball. We can also work with people who are just learning how to use a paddle and hit a ball. One of the, the simplest modifications we make is that um, people with mobility concerns get two bounces of the pickleball. Um, it's a, a simple adaptation. We also have a ball with a rattle for people with visual needs um, and beeper boxes we can put up by the net. Um, so we're kind of really expanding, um, you know, thinking about who can play this game. Uh, next slide, Keith. And then I just wanted to briefly mention a couple of things coming up uh, in September. We have uh, an event called the Kayakathon. We'll have a flotilla of about 100 people. Um, we kayak, canoe, and paddleboard from Sunderland to Hatfield to Northampton on the Connecticut River. It's our significant fundraiser, um, but it's also what I love about it. It's an incredibly inclusive community event. People of all ages and all abilities, including many people with disabilities, uh, participate in this event. Next slide, Keith. Chillier, but nice to think about today is um, in the uh, late winter, early spring, we run a, a plunge event up at the DAR in Goshen. Um, this is a photo from last year where we had to cut through about eight inches of ice to access the, a plunge hole in the lake. Um, but this is a fundraiser for our equipment rental, uh, which I'll mention is in just a second. Next slide, Keith. And we also, um, at our shop in Northampton on Pleasant Street, we sell and service recumbent trikes. Um, people come from all over New England um, to get our assistance in fitting trikes um, to people of all abilities and their purchases um, directly support our programs. Um, I've mentioned our programs before, which are our fees, which are very uh, low cost or free um, and it's proceeds from our fundraisers and the trike shop to help make that possible. And next slide, Keith. Um, and these are the different ways to get involved. Um, our website, it's all at adventures.org. People can visit and then email us uh, to sign up for a program. We reserve equipment and staff for the time people are coming to make sure that, that they can participate. Um, we also now rent our equipment um, so people can plan their own adventure and rent a hiking wheelchair or a recumbent trike or a tennis wheelchair um, to go off on their own adventure. And it's a sliding scale, um, so it's financially accessible to all. Um, and then we also have volunteer opportunities. Um, 
So our contact information is um, on our website. Our phone number is 413-584-2052. We welcome your phone calls, emails, contact um, to know how you can get involved. That's all I have. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. That was, that was an amazing presentation. And um, I've definitely, during our question and answer period, I'll definitely have some uh, questions to ask. It's very exciting. Um, and I also Thank just you. wanted to, of course, yeah. And just, just wanted to mention to everybody that, that we'll have a question and answer period after all the speakers are done. So um, while people are speaking, feel free to think of some questions that you want to ask everybody. Um, and okay, so we'll move on to the next speaker, um, which is uh, Aaron Morrison from um, the All In Barrier Free Recreation Program at CHD. Aaron Morrison. All right, thanks guys. Um, so I represent the obviously All In Barrier Free Recreation, which is funded by CHD, the Center for Human Development. We are involved in a wide variety of adaptive sports and recreation programs for kids and adults. I'm reading from a script that was given to me by my program director. When we do the question and answer stuff, I'll uh, be a little less wooden, I guess. Um, we're primarily in the Western Massachusetts area, but we are expanding to the Worcester area this year as we are absorbing players from another sled hockey program that unfortunately had it been basically disbanded. Um, there are three staff members at, at All In Sports, uh, one full time. Uh, we really count on our, our volunteers to support our, our programs. Each year we have about 50 to 80 volunteers helping out with our programs. For our, our programs, we uh, include sled hockey, which is our big one, adaptive rock climbing, cycling, wheelchair basketball, swimming, dance and movement, uh, inclusive curling, which is a new thing for us. You know, somebody saw curling on TV and said, hey, let's figure out a way to make it work. Um, other programs we sporadically offer during the summer are fishing, kayaking, martial arts, and CrossFit. Uh, we always have events to get people into a sled or to try out whatever programs we're working on uh, free of charge. So that way we can get more people interested and we try to get more volunteers interested in those programs as well. It's, it's a good time to watch able-bodied people see the playing field get leveled by the adaptations that we make in all of the sports programs. Uh, so we have some really good community uh, organizations and businesses Right now, our biggest sponsor for our sled hockey program is the Springfield Thunderbirds. They provide us with our jerseys. They give us the bulk of our practice ice at the Mass Mutual Center, which to a lot of the younger players is is just a huge selling point because they get to skate where the Thunderbirds skate. Um, Melia Park is another supporter of us for our sled hockey and inclusive curling program. Um, we actually have two, two sections of our, our sled hockey program. We have a travel team, which is very competitive. And we have our recreational team, which is a lot, of, a lot of people get, you know, it's an introduction. It's less intense during tournaments and gameplay and things like that. Um, our age range from our players is four years old to, I believe our oldest player is in his late fifties. Um, so we, we, we run the gamut with our, our sled hockey program. And then um, we have a, you know, competitive season runs from September to May. Um, travel team, we do one tournament at home, which will be September 21st and 22nd at UMass, which is open to the public. We also do rock climbing at Central Rock in Hadley uh, twice a month. And Western New England University runs, it helps us run a swimming program in the fall and winter. Um, as, you know, a nonprofit, we are definitely uh, depending upon grants and donations and stuff, as a lot of other organizations are as well. We're not exclusive to that by any means. Um, but we, we do a couple of big fundraisers. Right now in September on the 20th, um, we have the band Trailer Trash does a show for us every year. They put on a concert. And uh, the place we run it at runs the kitchen and they obviously the bar and everything else. And then we have a game called the Camera Cup, which takes place usually February or March um, at the Mass Mutual Center. That's one of our other big fundraisers. Our players get to have a couple of competitive games. Our, our recreational program plays local celebrities. And our tra uh, travel program, we play against one of the teams we play against a lot. And it gets really competitive. And it gets really intense because for us, the Camera Cup is to honor a player who was on the team when the program started who unfortunately passed away. So those are our two big ones. And then we have a cycling event or sometimes two or three to, uh, in East Long Meadow. 
and then um that's kind of how we how we run our thing it's a lot lot more of sports kind of sports oriented but if you see the players when they they start to develop their skills and you see the change in them it makes it all worthwhile um and then Anybody who would be interested in our program, you could um, email Jess at J Levine. Uh, that's capital J, L E V I N E at chd dot org, or you can just go to our website chd dot org. So that's kind of it. I'll just kind of not talk until we get to the question and answer section. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Aaron. You're welcome. Really appreciate that. Okay, on to our next presentation. Um, Meg Bondara, the founder of Unpaved Trails for All. Hello, Meg. Hello, Councillor Dubs. Thank you for having me. Um, Unpaved Trails for All is a little different from the first two organizations that we've heard from in that we don't offer programs. Um, we're just volunteer advocates who are disability-led, disability allies, who um, just want more accessible trails and particularly unpaved trails. So the photo that is on the screen right now is Mount Tom North, which is an unpaved accessible trail in East Hampton. And it's made from stone dust. It's a beautiful green in the summertime, calm, just wonderful natural space. Um, Keith, if you go to the next slide. And on this slide, there are uh, a few more photos from trails. One is the Fort River Accessible Trail in Hadley, which is a mixture of stone dust and wooden boardwalks. And the photo on the right is from the Lake Wallace Sensory Trail in Belchertown that has a guide wire and has braille, both navigation and kind of interest point signs. So it's um, really the only trail in the area that has non-visual navigation. And the reason why we advocate for these spaces, educate about these spaces is because, well, first of all, we don't have enough of them in our state. Uh, less than 0.5, less than zero, 0.5%, so less than 1%, less than half of a percent of our trails in the state are accessible. Um, we have 4,000 miles of unpaved trails in the state and only seven and a half miles in our state parks are accessible. So we have a lot of growth that needs to happen in this area. Um, and the reason why these species are important is because we get health and wellness benefits from spending time in nature, but that's really important for those of us who have disabilities because we're far more likely to develop stress-related illnesses than our non-disabled peers. We just have more stress in our life when you have to worry about whether or not you can get into a space, get to a space, navigate a space, whether or not you're going to feel ableism or exclusion. Those are all stressor points and we just have more stress in our lives. Um, these are social spaces, hobby spaces, work spaces for me. I'm an artist, so I work on these trails as well. Um, and then because we're here celebrating Disability Pride Month, these are also spaces that talk about equity and civil rights. These are public spaces, publicly funded spaces, and there's a civil rights component to having access to them. Next slide, please, Keith. And on the theme of... Um, advocacy and civil rights. We are also working on the Trails for All Act, which is S.446 and H.769. It is a bill that would expand access to trails for people of all abilities in Massachusetts. And we've gotten really far. Um, we've gotten some favorable reports from the first committee that it was with. It is now sitting with Senate Ways and Means. There are just a couple of weeks left in the session. So we've just been asking folks who feel passionate about the ability to be out there and recreating to contact the chair of that committee, which is Senator Michael Rodriguez, and um, to ask them to just give a favorable report to this bill. We have more information about the bill on our website, which is unpavedtrailsforall.org, and I will also put it in the chat. Uh, next slide, please, Keith. And then I thought that I would 
wrap things up with just talking about local trails because um, there's also a resource to share. So if on a trail like this or they are hard to find because that is one of the problems is that these trails are hard to find. I thought I would give you a list of some of the trails in the area. So East Hampton um, tops the list with three trails. Uh, Mount Tom North, which is between 108 and 110 East Street. Mudders Field, which is at 417 East Street. Arcadia Wildlife All Persons Trail, that's at 127 Combs Road. And that's part of the Mass Audubon property. So there is an entry fee. In Hadley, there's the Fort River Accessible Trail at Silvio Oconte U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge uh, at 69 Moody Bridge Road. That's a beautiful trail. Belcher Town has the Lake Wallace Sensory Trail, which is near Whitlock Way, which is the only trail in the area that has non-visual navigation. And Goshen um, at a DCR property, there is the Lake Loop Trail, which is um, part of the DAR State Forest. And then there is a new trail coming in Amherst this fall. It should be open, I think, in October. That's going to be on the Hickory Ridge um, former golf course property. I will note that Northampton does not have a trail on this list yet. We are waiting for that trail still, and we are um, wanting that trail very badly in Northampton. We should be on this list. Um, but I also do want to say thank you to the Disability Commission for supporting the Trails for All bill um, and the city itself for supporting that bill as well. They passed a resolution in support of it. So I'm looking forward to Northampton being listed on this list of local trails. Um, and then last slide, please, Keith. Just to say happy Disability Pride Month. And the photo is the Disability Pride flag. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Meg. Wonderful presentation. And coming up next, we have um, David Fenton, uh, the deputy of Triad Medical Equipment Lending Program. Welcome, David. Oh, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is kind of new turf for us. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little about what we do and what we've done, and then I can kind of see how it segues into uh, where we're at now with this with this commission. Uh, I run a program called Triad on behalf of Sheriff Kaling. Uh, the Triad program actually started nationally in 1988 and was brought to this area by Sheriff Garvey at the time, our, our previous sheriff, in 1992. Um, what triad is, is, is not an acronym. Triad is merely the coming together of three different groups. Uh, picture a triangle, if you will. One side of the triangle is uh, support and protective services, which in our area is your councils on aging, your fire departments, uh, civic groups, uh, West Mass Elder Care, Highland Valley, Cooley Dick VNA. Um, pretty much anybody that wants to come to the table to work on senior issues, educate folks uh, about senior safety and and uh, it, it's been a very good partnership with them. The other side of the triangle would be your law enforcement component, which in our area is your, your sheriff's office, your local police departments, and your district attorney's office. And the third part of the triangle, the most important part of the triangle is your senior citizens. Um, Triad is a group that all these, all these different agencies get together on a monthly basis, discuss senior issues uh, from a senior's perspective. Um, Back in 1992, when it started, I had no idea what that was. Now that I'm 62, I kind of have a little bit better idea with the aches and pains. But uh, um, basically, everyone comes to the table and discuss uh, the perception of crime, crime statistics. Uh, we try and put programs together to alleviate the fears and, and apprehensions that seniors may have. And, uh, you know, several things have come out of this uh, early on in triad. Seniors were concerned about if they needed medical help how would the person responding know what to do or know who they were dealing with or what medications they were on. And um, one of our seniors developed something called the file of life. Hopefully you've seen it. It is a magnetic pouch that goes on the front of your refrigerator. It's red. It has a card inside with all the uh, pedigree of the person, medications they're on, doctor's contacts, insurance information, um, and all the, all that important stuff. So now that the emergency response people knew who they were dealing with and um, how to deal with them a little bit better and what ailments they might have. Uh, they were concerned about uh, how are they going to find us? And, you know, years ago, uh, a firefighter or police officer used to have to live 
usually in the jurisdiction or within a very close proximity of the jurisdiction. Uh, now with mutual aid, you have police departments or fire departments, you have the ambulance services that are showing up from uh, in Northampton. You might have an ambulance come in from East Hampton or from Amherst or from Belchertown if, uh, if everyone's tied up. You never know who's coming in. So they're not going to know where, where a senior has lived all their life. So we created, uh, this started actually in Granby, we created a, a program where we numbered houses and we number houses throughout the county. It works differently in different communities as far as who installs them. But with our partnerships, usually the Council on Aging take the information and uh, disseminate it to the, the powers to be that will go out and install the numbers. So this kind of took away the, the part of, uh, you know, can they find us? We put the numbers out. There's actually a law in the books that you're supposed to have your house numbered uh, in, in contrasting color of the house visible from the street. So this is just a, a tool that we've used to help people get their houses numbered and get the emergency response personnel um, out to the home in, in, a, in a timely fashion. And uh, we've heard so many so many responses from places like the AAA going out to give a person assistance or clergy that are going out to see their parishioners, visiting nurses going out to see their, their, uh, their, their clients. So uh, it, it was a lot broader than just our, our small focus of wanting to get emergency response personnel to them quicker. So that's worked well. Um, we work very closely with uh, the DEA and we, we help organize, Triad helps organize in Hampshire County, a national program called the National Drug Take Back Initiative. Uh, to date, we have, it's, it's something that takes place twice a year, uh, usually in the spring and usually in the fall. And at those events, we set up spots all over Hampshire County for people to bring their, their unused um, medications could be pet medications, could be over the counter, could be vitamins. We just want to get them out of the people's homes. One, so there's no overdose uh, issues, and two, so it doesn't go in the in the doesn't get polluted in the landfills or in the water systems. So we we've, we've been very successful with that to date. I think we've collected. Uh, I had to look at it real quick, but I think it's somewhere around seventy four thousand pounds of of medication that we've collected and disposed of properly. And for a small place like Hampshire County. That's an awful lot of pills over the years. So we're very proud of that statistic and very proud of, of the work that the seniors have done getting the word out to the local doctors, the local pharmacies, the local veterinary clinics um, and students at schools. Uh, you know, it, it, we've, there's no real uh, rule on how we do it. We just do it and it's worked very well. Uh, our most recent initiative that started about three and a half years ago uh, due to, due to uh, what Triad tries to do is not reinvent the wheel, not try and create something that's already going or step on anybody's toes. We try and help programs that are already there, maybe boost them up a little bit. Or if there's not a program in place, we try and fill the void. So we saw a void being created, um, local senior centers, uh, maybe due to COVID, due to lack of staffing, lack of storage. Uh, several several of them discontinued their durable medical equipment distribution programs. Uh, Northampton no longer distributes or collects uh, medical durable medical equipment through their senior center, nor does South Hadley. East Hampton just stopped as of July first. Um, so it, that's that's a big that's a big problem. Amherst does not do it anymore. So we kind of stepped in and we figured we'd help out and fill that void. And the program has become overwhelming, uh, overwhelming in a good way. We are very, very busy with uh, collection of medical equipment, distribution of medical equipment. And uh, there's three of us that do it here at the uh, Hampshire Sheriff's Office for the triad program. Uh, we are constantly on the run, which is a nice thing. But um, uh, this year, this year in particular, we have, um, we've collected and distributed a, a, about a quarter million dollars worth of medical equipment. That's commodes, um, walkers, wheelchairs, transport chairs, crutches, uh, shower chairs, tub seats. Yeah, it, you know, it goes on and on. We've people have donated power lift chairs. They've donated uh, um, uh, power wheelchairs, uh, power scooters. Uh, and we take stuff that's clean um, in working order, something that you'd give out to your family member. We don't uh, we don't take stuff that we have to reconstruct and. And, uh, and get all the barnacles off of. We want fairly clean stuff and we, we have been very successful. We have not spent a penny 
on any on any equipment. We haven't bought a uh, a stopper for the bottom of a cane. We haven't bought a, a pad for the arm of a of a of a crutch. Uh, it's all been donated to us, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful community effort throughout all of Hampshire County. Uh, we deliver from from Worthington to Ware and all points in between, all twenty communities. So, uh, what we thought was going to be just uh, let's give let's give the community a little bit of a hand has been an overwhelming um, uh, initiative. So. Uh, our program deals with seniors. Uh, it is basically for senior citizens. We do get the question, well, how old is a senior citizen? And again, now that I'm 62, it's I think it's a lot older. But uh, realistically, uh, you know, 50, 55 is what we give and up. We give uh, equipment out to. Uh, we kind of have to stick to that because we are overwhelmed assisting seniors. We do get some specialty medical equipment in, and we have many, many partners that we that we deal with on this, and we're very proud of that. Um, one of our one of our best partners is Full Circle Bike Shop up in Florence. Uh, they have been very gracious to us. Every time we have um, a rollator that has need a, needs a brake adjustment, we bring them in. They either change out the cable or adjust the brakes for us free of charge. And they've been absolutely wonderful. Um, Bob the Bike Guy, and I know some of the presenters before know who Bob is because they've dealt with uh, dealt with Bob on different uh, events and so forth. Bob's been wonderful. He's a brand new partner in, in this whole uh, whole scheme that we're doing in a scheme of things. Uh, the Westfield Masonic Temple uh, is another resource. And then Stavros, who I guess is presenting uh, right after me, but Stavros, uh, we, for, we refer people to Stavros all the time. Uh, the one thing we don't handle in our uh, medical equipment distribution is hospital beds. And that's when we really refer those out to the Westfield Masonic Temple or, the, or Stavros or MediQuip. Um, another quick website so um one last thing you, you know you're talking about disabilities and so forth belchertown uh, belchertown at the in our triad program early on in triad uh we did an did an experiment we had some some kids who in the high school that wanted to uh, do a project and the seniors wanted to work with them so what we did we took we had the seniors uh from the from the high school go out to local businesses with crutches with walkers, with wheelchairs. And this was a project. They went around to our local businesses and they tried to, to access um, entry into and exit out of the, the buildings, whether it be a local store, um, a school, a restaurant. And they tried to get in these places with the devices and they were overwhelmed at how difficult it was to get in and out. And they wrote papers on it. And, they talked to the owners about it. And uh, in some cases, you know, uh, you know, the ramp came up from the right, but the door opened from the left. So they had to go past the door, turn around, and they're on an elevated sidewalk. So, you know, the business owner changed which side the hinges were on uh, to make it more accessible. Simple little things like that. I thought it was a, a wonderful program for the high school students to to get involved with, to, to work with the senior citizens on uh, in that community and, and the business people. It, it went very well. But and with that, I will close and just uh, wait for any Q&A that comes our way, if it does. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, David. That was an excellent presentation. And we'll look forward to questions later for that. Uh, um, and coming up next, we have Andrea from Stavros Independent Living uh, Center for Independent Living. Or possibly Carmen Rosado. Hello. Um, okay. Uh, my um, co-workers probably couldn't make it. Um, I'm going to talk about what programs we have. We have program. Oh, I'm an advocate at Stavros. And my name is Carmen Rosado. I've been working at Stavros for the last 15 years. I work directly with community outreach and um. We have different programs. One is a nursing home initiative. Um, it's called the Home Sweet. And we had the Home Sweet Home um, that uh, does have the access for building ramps. We work with different agencies to um, get the funds for the ramps and also work 
with different uh, colleges for volunteering uh, with us. We also have the youth transition, the transition program with we serve youth from 14 to 22 years old and we help with IEPs getting also employment and other uh, situations that they might encounter. We do activities with them and other stuff. Also, we have the personal care attendant program that helps uh, people of basically almost all ages uh, to live independently through the assistance with a PCA. Uh, the program works with directly with MassHealth. The MassHealth is the one that approves the hours of the PCA program. Also, we have um, a housing transition uh, person who does uh, webinars uh, about how to get housing. Uh, we have advocates that can assist in many types of disability related uh, issues. They don't need to have muscle for that or anything like that, only to have a disability. Um, and we also do other programs depending on what the person who calls us is looking for. We also work with other agencies like the older services and um, we have the re re-equipment program. Um, we get the equipment from donation from other people. We um, have a website thing. I forgot the name of the website, but I'm gonna put our website uh, in the chat so you can learn more about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. That was awesome. Okay, coming up next, we have um, Denise Sullivan, the owner of the um, Sullivan Consulting Educational Advocates. Yes, good evening. Oh, I Hello. hope everybody, uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I do apologize, as I had mentioned earlier, my camera in the middle of a mediation today, decided to stop working. Ah, but we we digress, but we still move on. Um, my name is Denise Sullivan, and I am what is called a special education advocate. I uh, started this business about, well, I just finished my 25th year of Special Education Advocacy. I um, I went into it for uh, a few reasons. Um, one, I myself have a disability, and I use the uh, support of a mobility scooter now in this time of my life. Prior to that, I was on crutches. So I've always had access concerns. Um, special education is not just for um, what schools like to say, cognitive disabilities. Uh, it can be physical disabilities. It can be emotional. It can be um, medically involved. It can, uh, there are a multitude of areas that can be addressed under what we call an individual education plan uh, or an IEP. We have had um, federal regulations under IDEA, Individual 
Disability Education Act uh, since, I believe, 1977. And I was actually in high school when that was uh, transforming into the laws that we carry today. Um, they were helpful. And what I will say about special education is that what it allows for is equal access to anything um, an average student would be able to access. Um, I, I myself uh, served as chairwoman for our commission for the disabled in my city for 13 years. I served as our special education parent advisory council president for 12 years while my children were in school. Um, I was a person who needed the support of what we call a 504 plan, uh, which is under the Office of Civil Rights, uh, to where it allows for reasonable accommodations. And what I do as an advocate is I help support families secure services that their child may need for uh, accessing the school environment. And it's not just the education. It's also the, um, the whole social atmosphere. Uh, it's also to access extracurricular activities. Uh, these documents will help a child be able to access whatever uh, aspect they would like of school. Um, an IEP is actually a legal binding contract between the school district and the parents. And once that document is signed, it is enforceable through uh, regulations and laws. Uh, and if it isn't, there are mechanisms to help a family secure those um, services. If anybody needs any support with education, um, I'm very easy to be found. Uh, I contract with many state agencies to help support children with special education needs. And um, I, I'm going to leave it at that for now, as I would rather answer more direct questions if, you know, if warranted. But special education is a entitlement uh, to a child that needs services or programming in order to access the full community of the school. So I will, I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Denise. Excellent presentation. And coming up Thank next, you. yes, of course. And coming up next, we have um, Cindy Mahoney from CPAC, um, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to sit down. Sorry, I was standing earlier. Um, so um, I'm here this evening as one of the officers of Northampton's Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And I should introduce myself too. first. Um, I'm a white woman wearing glasses and a blue striped shirt. Um, and with a name like Murphy Mahoney, I have my fair share of freckles. Um, so then if you could please go on to the next slide, Keith. Um, and I think that Keith will have this available for any members who wish to refer to it later. But this is a link to the Northampton Public Schools CPAC website. 
And Northampton now has a new director of student services. His name is Matthew Holloway. Celeste Malvezzi is the assistant director. And again, I've included both their emails here. Should any um, person who's attending this evening wish to contact them? Um, not sure what happened to the PowerPoint, but <laughs> there we go. Um, Lauren Berry is the family student engagement and the English language coordinator um, at Northampton. And Northampton also has what's called an LPAC. So the CPAC is the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. The LPAC is the English Language Learner Parent Advisory Council. And we do have a liaison with Northampton's school committee, that school committee member, Holly Gazy. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please, Keith. So the Northampton Student Services Department oversees special education, English language education, family engagement, the early childhood department, compliance with the 504 process, and it also supports homeless and foster students. Next slide, please. So the disability types in the Massachusetts state special education regulations are the following 11. So in order for a student to qualify for an IEP, they must have one of these disabilities, autism, developmental delay, intellectual impairment, sensory impairment, hearing, vision, deafblind, neurological impairment, emotional impairment, communication impairment, physical impairment, health impairment, or specific learning disability. Um, then the next slide, please. As Denise mentioned, um, there's something called an individualized education program, often referred to as an IEP, and there's also a 504. The IEP is a formal plan that details the special education services and supports a school will provide to meet the unique needs of a student with a disability. And this includes specially designed instruction. A 504 plan is a formal plan for how a school will remove barriers so a student with a disability can learn alongside peers in general education. It does not include specially designed instruction. Okay, so then the next slide, please. Um, here are some resources from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. There's a pretty cool module now that is on DESE's website and gives a terrific overview for families of the special education process in terms of timelines, evaluations, things like that for families to know. There's also going to be a new IEP that will be implemented across the state in all districts beginning this fall. If you're interested in seeing that, if um, there's a link there on the website. And if you feel that a school or a district is not following procedure in terms of timelines or implementing the child's, the student's IEP, there is something called a problem resolution system, which families can contact and they will investigate the claim. Families can also contact the United States Office of Civil Rights. They have a focus, an office that focuses on education and it's in Boston. Um, there's a link there. But again, for all of this information, that's why CPAC is here. That's why there are, um, we, I will in, give you that information in a few slides, but the CPAC community is one that has a wealth of knowledge. And so we encourage families, if they have questions, to post a question to the Google group. And someone often has a, um, either a resource or the right answer. So this is a lot of technical information, but I just want to get across the point that CPAC is here for families that have special education needs in Northampton. Um, the next slide, please, talks about our CPAC. So our logo is two trees bending towards each other with a heart shape in the middle and leaves on the ground. 
So um, as I mentioned, CPAC stands for Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And the CPAC is something that is required for all districts. Um, and we are open to all caregivers or students with disabilities, teachers, and any interested city resident. The CPAC participates in the planning and development and evaluation of special education programs. Um, we foster communication. That's a big part of our role is fostering communication between schools and, and families and the district as a whole. Um, and we support the network for caregivers of students with disabilities. Membership is free, okay. All you need to do is send an email to that email address, northamptoncpac at gmail.com. There's also a Facebook group. Um, okay, and then the next slide, please. We do have a website. It is a work in progress, so I ask for your patience. And I appreciate your patience this evening because this is my very first PowerPoint. So <laughs> um, this school year, we're planning to have monthly meetings, the fourth Monday of every month via Zoom. We always meet via Zoom, except for our end of the year award ceremony. And I'll speak about that in just a moment. Um, but these meetings, we often invite um, like the director of special education or someone to present about a new IEP or perhaps a workshop on bullying. Um, so we try and have a focus. And then there's also time for families to connect. Um, so there's an email that you can send to the officers if you have a question or concern, perhaps you don't want to post to the whole group. There's also the group email address. So for the officers, it's northamptoncpac at gmail.com to join the Google group. That's nohocpac at googlegroups.com. Um, the next slide, please. There are, I've, in oh, I've included several resources. Um, including a link to the Federation for Children with Special Needs. They do a lot of training. Mass Advocates for Bolt for Children has a terrific um, webinar on bullying. The Parent Professional Advocacy League does a lot um, of work around mental health for children and youth. Pathlight is the local DDS Family Support Center. DDS is the Department of Developmental Services. And there's also... Um, an email group that comes out from Greater Mass Special Needs events. And that would post many of the events that we saw earlier, like all outdoors and things like that. Um, lastly, I do have a colleague, I work part-time for the Federation for Children with Special Needs. And my colleague, Deanna, um, if you could go to the last slide, Keith. Deanna, do you wanna jump in and talk a little bit about coordinated pandemic relief? And next gen. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to talk. <laughs> You're much better than I. So <laughs> I don't think so. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm Deanna Biagioli. I work with Cindy. She's uh, very humble. She does um, not only the work she does for the CPAC, but she also works for the Generation, and she's an amazing resource. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about these um, coordinated pandemic relief direct support stipend. I'm not going to go into too much detail on how we got involved because it is a complicated story. But if you if you know anybody who was born between March 10th of 1998 and September 30th of 2001, the one is missing on the slide. Sorry. Um, and they also had to be in school uh, using special education services of any kind. Um, they are eligible for a, a stipend that we um, are now giving out at the Federation for Children with Special Needs. But also, in addition to that, they're eligible for other services. So please get in touch with us. Uh, Cindy, maybe you could put the flyer in the chat or I can do it when I'm done talking. Um, but, uh, oh, that's in there. Oh, you have, the, you have the link in there, I see it, okay. Uh, all right, and then let's move on to Next Gen Careers Initiative. I'm very involved in that. Uh, Next Gen Careers is a, pilot program uh, that is run by MRC, Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. 
And as many of you probably know, um, MRC does uh, VR services for anybody with a disability. But right now they're running a pilot program for young people 18 to 30 who, um, who are uh, looking for employment uh, as quickly as possible. Um, they are, um, this is a much more, uh, I, I call it a more rigorous, a more involved program because they don't only have one counselor, they have a whole team that works with them. They have an, a career counselor, an employment specialist, uh, a peer mentor, a family partner, and even a benefits counselor if they need it. They can use as many of the team members as they want or as few. And this is a new way that they're piloting in some areas of Massachusetts, not all towns and, and um, cities are included, but Northampton is included. So that's why we're featuring here. Um, so if you want more information on that, you can reach out to either Cindy or me. I can put my email on the chat. Anything I left out about CPR or next gen, Cindy? No, I'm so grateful you stepped in. Thank you, Deanna. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Thank All you right. both. Thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing from you this evening. Or awesome. Thank you, Cindy and Diana. Great presentation. Really appreciate it. Okay. Um, coming up next, we have Ben Kalish. He's the cataloger and the tech librarian at Forbes Library. And he regu regularly attends our Disability Commission meetings and is often a very big help to us. Welcome, Ben. Hello, all. I'm Benjamin Kalish, a librarian at Forbes Library. Um, I've been involved in accessibility work at the library since 2015 when we started our advisory board. Um, and I always like to give a shout out to the advisory board. Um, it is, um, the purpose is to advise the library on how to make its services more accessible. We also have the opportunity to suggest um, programming and displays that feature disability and accessibility issues. Um, and anyone can take part in our advisory board meetings. We meet three times a year. Um, there's lots of information about it on our website. Um, I encourage anyone who is interested to take um, part in that. Um, so what does Forbes Library do that might be of interest here? And it's pretty vast in a way. I worked at the reference desk for many years and I think of the job as a reference librarian as being professionally helpful. So one of the things we do is help connect you to the resources you need, help you find things you are looking for. But some particular things I'd like to call out, Forbes Library has a delivery service. So we can, um, within Northampton, we can deliver library materials to you and we can pick up library materials to you. So if you can't get to the library, it's not a problem. Um, we do a lot of technology help, computers, smartphones, tablets, et cetera. Um, of course, we have collections. Often the first thing people think of is books, and we have books in large print. We have books on CD. Um, many of our videos um, have um, audio description and captions, and we've really gone out of our way to try to make it easier to find the materials you need. Um, so we, we have various tips and tricks, we have good labeling, so forth, to help you if you need a video with um, description. And there's a lot of videos. Some of them have description, some don't. How do you find one that's going to work for you? We can absolutely help with that um, and show you how to do it as well. Um, along the lines of those accessible collections, there are great collections of accessible ebooks that you can't get from Forbes Library but we can help connect you to them. We have a very um, good working relationship with Perkins Library, um, and we um, can help you um, with the paperwork to get um, enrolled in their programs with programs like Bookshare, et cetera. Um, the library has various assistive technology, not all of which I can possibly list here, um, but I particularly do want to call out our assistive listening systems. We have three assistive listening systems um, in the library for programming, assistive listening systems at all our desks, our um, public service desks. And I'm very proud to say we now also have an assistive listening system kit that you can borrow um, and bring to a public meeting or 
it doesn't have to be a public meeting to anything. We're not going to ask. Um, if you are doing an event of any kind where you think that would be helpful, it can be a square dance. It can be a movie screening. If it would be helpful to have people have their own little device that picks up the audio and they can trust the volume themselves. And of course, it works with telecoils if they have hearing aids that support that. And it works with headphones if that is someone's preferred thing. Um, that is something that you can now borrow from the library. Um, I want to mention, of course, we um, accommodate all sorts of disabilities for programs. Those assistive listening systems are there. Um, but we really want to go above and beyond what is required by the law. So please, um, folks, whether coming to an advisory board meeting, letting us know before attending a program, or just sending us an email or stopping by, let us know what we can do to do a better job to serve you. Um, I'll leave everything else for questions. Just I want to throw out ForbesLibrary.org slash accessibility. That web page will give you a really good summary of some of what I've talked about and a whole lot more. And you can reach us at accessibility at ForbesLibrary.org. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, great job. And moving on now to Tom Murphy, uh, supervising attorney at the Disability Law Center, which uh, is here in Northampton. Welcome, Tom. Hi, thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be part of this program. So uh, as Jeremy mentioned, I'm an attorney at the Disability Law Center. We're the protection and advocacy system for uh, the entire state of Massachusetts. Um, our main office is actually in Boston. Uh, we do have an, an, an office out here in Northampton as well, though. Um, and you can see our website there in the first so slide. It's dlc-ma.org. You go to the next slide, please. So um, we're a legal services organization. Uh, our mission is to provide legal advocacy on disability issues that promote the fundamental rights of all people with disabilities to participate fully and equally in the social and economic life of Massachusetts. So um, we do that in a variety of ways that, uh, that I'll talk to in a little bit, but um, primarily we are, um, uh, to put it in a nutshell, we're, we're a nonprofit law firm. Um, we do advocacy for people with disabilities and we do systemic work as well. Um, but we are a nonprofit. We are private. We're not part of uh, state or federal government. Although um, some, some of our funding does come from, uh, from both of those uh, entities, both, both federal and state. Next slide, please. Um, and just a little bit in terms of the background of the protection and advocacy system. Uh, every every state and territory has a designated PNA. Um, so as I mentioned, we we are the PNA for, and we cover the entire state of Massachusetts. Um, the PNA system was created uh, back in the 1970s when um, many of the large institutions uh, were were being uh, closed, and people with disabilities were were being uh, served more and more in the community. Uh, Congress understood that um, there needed to be an independent um, agency within each state and territory to ensure that people with disabilities were being served uh, in a way which, um, which was compliant with the law. And, uh, and so they created the PNA system uh, sort of as, as a watchdog um, uh, to have an organization in each state that had authority um, to, um, to promote the rights of people with disabilities, but also to ensure that any, any entity, including the state, uh, that's providing services for people with disabilities was doing so um, uh, in, a, in a way which was, which was uh, inclusive and in, compli <clears throat> in compliance with uh, various state and federal laws. So we are, we are as I mentioned, an independent organization. We can, we can conduct investigations of, of state agencies and um, uh, of services being provided by the states, and we can uh, bring lawsuits if necessary. Um, we protect uh, people with disabilities by um, uh, advocating for and monitoring for safety issues, as well as abuse and neglect. 
Uh, and we also do direct advocacy as well. Um, so that would include um, some individual representation as well as, as, well as systemic um, actions and, and, and um, lawsuits. And, the, and those are primarily on, on civil rights and education related issues, um, <clears throat> as well as, uh, as working on, on legislative issues. Uh, next state uh, slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, we, we, the PNA system came out of uh, the deinstitutionalization process that started back in the 1970s. Um, states uh, more and more were, were providing services for people with disabilities in community-based uh, programs. Um, and primarily our charge is to uh, monitor and investigate uh, and protect people with disabilities from abuse and neglect in those, in those programs. Um, we do a lot of work around civil rights and around self-determination, um, as well as to equal access to good services and privileges. And um, a, a lot of the work that we, that we do stems from a Supreme Court case from the late 1990s called Olmstead, um, which uh, was really a landmark case for people with disabilities and requires that uh, entities provide programs and services in the most integrated setting appropriate for them um, and, and primarily held as, as the fundamental um, basis of, of the decision that any form of segregation of people with disabilities is a form of discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So a lot of our work um, sort of stems from, from, that, from that very idea. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, what we do, um, primarily we, uh, we are required by our funders to monitor and investigate abuse and neglect of people with disabilities. Um, under the, uh, the federal statutes, which created the PNA system and, and give us the authority to do what we do, um, we have uh, unique uh, authority to go really any place where people with disabilities are being served, where, where, they, where they live, um, where they are receiving services, and um, either, either monitor, uh, just, just go in and um, sort of look around, talk to people, um, or if we suspect that there is abuse and neglect, uh, conduct a full investigation. Um, so, uh, so our monitoring authority is, is pretty broad. Um, we don't necessarily need uh, to, to suspect abuse and neglect to go to go someplace. Um, uh, and we, we are able to um, have access to the, uh, to the facilities, to the people that are there, talk to people, um, and uh, you know, really, really see if, um, if, if we have concerns about the services that are being provided. Um, and then if we do open an investigation of abuse and neglect, that gives, it gives us the ability to get records, to conduct um, further, you know, more in-depth uh, um, investigation, um, um, communicating with, with people that, that work at, at the institute, at, at the facilities, um, and, um, and, and if necessary, um, either do a public report uh, or um, uh, make sure that you know work work with it with the facility to make sure that that their their practices are, are changing if necessary um we also as i mentioned we do some individual representation so we provide uh free legal services for people with disabilities if uh if they have a disability related issue which meets our focus areas um our ability to uh to provide individual rep representation is somewhat limited. So, um, so every year we do go through a focus uh, setting process um, and determine what legal issues um, are would be the, the best use of our resources. Um, and uh, you can find those on our website. We provide information and referral. Um, so uh, over the course of a year, we'll get anywhere from about seven to 8,000 requests for assistance. Um, everyone that contacts us, uh, even if we can't provide them with uh, individualized services for, for their legal issue, um, we will provide them with information uh, and give them referrals to other appropriate resources that, that, um, 
that may be available to them. Um, we do do some policy and legislative and administrative work as well um, on, on issues that affect uh, people with disabilities. Um, we do systemic work such as uh, class action lawsuits um, and we provide training and technical assistance for people with disabilities, for caregivers, um, and, uh, and for service providers as well. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, primarily our function is to monitor and investigate for abuse and neglect. And um, related to that, we have unique access to facilities and to their residents. Um, we, under our federal authority, must be provided with reasonable unaccompanied access uh, at reasonable times to any, um, any facility or program that provides services to people with disabilities. And we can provide information, training and referral, um, or, and or we can monitor compliance um, with health and safety laws, with civil rights laws, uh, with, with human rights um, laws and practices as well. Um, and that can be either a public or a private facility. So, um, so we monitor in um, also in, in, in private hospitals. Um, we can monitor and investigate in nursing homes, um, board and care homes, community housing, uh, group living environments, schools, juvenile detention um, facilities, and homeless shelters and jails and prisons. So really. You know, as I've said, any anywhere that a person with disability is is living or receiving services, um, we can go in and, and monitor. Go ahead, Keith. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we uh, we have, as I mentioned, some a, a good part of our funding comes from the federal government, even though we are an independent en entity, um, and it does go back to the 1970s. There have been uh, different programs set up. Uh, to allow the PNAs to do the work that they do. Um, and each, each of the individual programs that we work under sort of has different criteria for the type of work that we do or the type of individual um, that we can serve. So for instance, the first program was, was called Protection and Advocacy for Developmental Disabilities. And that was in 1975 um, and allowed the PNA to provide um, legal services for, for and advocacy for people with developmental disabilities. Um, the, the number of programs uh, has expanded over the years, as well as the, the breadth of the work that we can do. Um, and at this point, we, we can serve a person with, with any type of disability um, and, and almost any type of, of legal issue that they have. Although there are some restrictions on the types of legal issues that we can cover. Um, we can't do criminal law, for instance. Um, we, we can't do uh, family law. Um, we, do, we can't do trust in the states and things like that. But primarily any issue that involves civil rights or human rights, um, we, 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 can, uh, we can work on under the funding that we get. We also get some state funding as well through the Legal Assistance Corporation. Um, they fund all of the legal services programs um, in the state like community legal aid out here in Western Mass. Um, and there's also a state program called CLAVIC, which stands for Civil Legal Aid for Victims of Crime. And uh, that allows us and other legal aid programs uh, to provide legal services for, for people who have been a victim of a crime and who are having a civil legal problem that is, that is related to that crime. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm um, sorry, Tom. I just wanted sure. to mention it's going. Um, we're at seven twenty now. Um, and okay. our, sorry, and it's it's been. Uh, I think it's been about twelve minutes since you've been speaking, and unfortunately, yeah, we're starting to run out of time. Um, yeah, no, can that's you, okay. Maybe just sum up. Just sum up what sure. you were going to say, real quick. Yeah, Thank I you think so this much. is my last slide, and that this is our contact information. Uh, and our on our website, you can you can find our focus areas, the, the types of cases that we do. Um, self-help materials as well as um, the way to uh, to to get in touch with us to ask for help. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. Okay. 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 Moving on to our next speaker, uh, William Joyce, the executive director of the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board.
Hi. Welcome, uh, welcome, William. Good to be here. So I'm William Joyce. I'm the executive director of the Architectural Access Board. Um, I am a white man uh, wearing a black polo shirt that has the state seal on it. Uh, so let, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the board because I, I have a hard out at 730. Um, so the Architectural Access Board, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're a nine-member board, which was established in the 1960s, although we've had a number of different names over the years, uh, <clears throat> which we were established by the legislature with the mandate to make building public buildings and facilities accessible to, functional for, and safe for use by persons with disabilities. So the primary way we do that is we promulgate and enforce Title 521 of the Code of Massachusetts Regulations, which is a set of regulations that define the requirements for physical accessibility and the design and construction of buildings and facilities. Uh, the board meets every other Monday to review, review variance applications and conduct adjudicatory hearings. And the board has a three member support staff, uh, which is myself, a program coordinator and a compliance officer. Next slide, please. So sort of the beating heart of what we do is 521 CMR. So it's a set of regulations. It defines a wide array of architectural features and building types. Uh, 2006 is our most recent edition. We're aware that is quite old. Uh, we are in the middle of a code round, which we hope will be our first full rewrite since 1996. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff in there that we are hopeful we'll be able to get to promulgate sometime in the next uh, year or two, uh, including hopefully additional rules about trails, um, dealing with electric vehicles and closing a lot of loopholes and fixing a lot of things where the code is currently confusing or vague. Um, so 521 CMR is available on our website. Uh, you can also purchase physical copies. I know uh, working with a lot of people in the construction trades, uh, they just love physical copies of everything. Uh, if you want it, you can get it at the State House Bookstore, which is both located in the State House and is available online if you want to purchase a physical copy and have them mail it to you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we just some basic areas that 521 CMR covers uh, pretty much any sort of public building. And when we say public building, we don't just mean buildings that are owned and operated by the Commonwealth, but any building that is open to and used by the public. So this would be restaurants, movie theaters, uh, hospitals, uh, pretty much any type of housing containing three or more dwelling units, hotels and motels. Uh, some ones that people don't necessarily think of right off the jump is we also have rules covering uh, detention facilities, uh, basically anywhere that's not limited to these employees only. Uh, people do confuse us with the ADA. We are not the same thing. We cover some things they don't. They cover some things we don't. Uh, for example, we don't. We are solely focused on the design and construction of buildings. We don't handle programmatic access, but we also cover things that the ADA doesn't, namely two-story buildings uh, and churches and other religious institutions. Uh, they are required to be accessible here in the Commonwealth, just like any other building that's open to the public. So uh, I'm just going to keep it short so there's time for questions. Um, so I will pass along right here. Awesome. Thank you so much, William. And moving on to our last presenter, Christos Palamas. He is the author of the Northampton Trans ADA Transition Plan and former chair of the Northampton Disability Commission. Welcome, Christos. Oh, we're having a hard time hearing you. Sorry, we still can't hear you, Christos. I think you might have frozen up. He's on there twice, and the second one looks like it's unmuted. So, Chris, when you were here before, on the looks like your desktop, when you first entered the meeting, we were able to hear you. Yeah, uh, I lost you on my computer. 
It's getting better. That sounds starting to sound better. Okay, I'm bringing it very close to my face. Will this work? Um, I, I'm seeing people uh, nod their head no. No. Hey, I'm I'm sorry, Dan. I'm sorry, Christos. Yeah. Um. Well, well, thank you to Christos for writing the uh, for being the author of the ADA transition plan which is um, an extremely important document that is leading Northampton to become more accessible and was recently, um, we recently in the city council, we, we, we uh, wrote a resolution in support of the ADA transition plan and all the councilors agreed to support it. And so, sorry that Christos can't, uh, is not able to speak with us today, but um, if anybody has any questions about the ADA, ADA transition plan, um, just let us know and we'll reach out to Christos and and um, get you in con get you and connect connected with him. I just so got um, I just got the computer back. Okay, awesome. Technology has its weird ways. Um, I will I'll try to be uh, brief about this. I'm not the author of the plan. I did an initial version of it. Okay. Um, I actually just read what was finally accepted. So um, the transition plan is where ADA requirements meet state uh, city government as a whole in Northampton. Uh, our story was, I was commissioner and uh, chairman of the Disability Commission. In around uh, 2016, we um, had a strong conversation with the uh, Office of Planning and Development, basically looking at the city's history um, it had responded, as most communities did, to the initial passage of the ADA with a first level of understanding of what the law was about. But the law continues to develop over time in its detail and thoroughness and uh, the way in which it's driving social change, which we've heard a lot about today. So... Um, at that point in 2016, we began a process of looking freshly at what was going on in the city and updating the transition plan. The transition plan under uh, Mayor Narkowitz was uh, um, very supportive in moving us forward. And then something happened, and it was the pandemic. And the pandemic put the process of um, really looking at this next wave of moving the city forward on accessibility, uh, to some extent, the pandemic put us on hold. So what has recently been done, and the city council has taken an important step, is to essentially dust off the plan and say, let's look at it again. Now, the Disability Commission will be key to this, and Keith is key to this. Um, there were 10 recommendations in the transition plan as adopted. I'll cover them very quickly. Number one was to have the person responsible, that is now key, have a job that's doable and dedicated to focusing on disability issues. Previously, it was an add-on proposition to people who were already more than committed full-time. So... We now have an ADA coordinator and a combination of ADA and Section 504, these two very, very closely related disability rights laws, located very near the office of the mayor, an important point. And now affirmed by the city council that it is time to take a real fresh look at the scope of work that needs to be done. The second priority was to um, intensify and improve work on curb cuts and accessibility in the pedestrian environment. A great deal is going on in this area, most significantly of which is the planning on the reconstruction and redesign of downtown, but also dispersed throughout the city. There are provisions also addressed in the priorities um, that when you find in a local neighborhood some deficiency in terms of access routes, the deterioration of existing access routes, or some that have never been provided, um, bring that to the ADA coordinator um, to move it into and look at 
the scheduling of public works to be done in the city and sometimes to deal um, more effectively with emergency situations. Um, the third was to um, provide a key provision in the ADA, which is reasonable modifications to policies and procedures. The more common language was reasonable accommodation. What we found very often in act, interacting with city departments, when a particular individual presented a need or interest in having something unusual done, the departments would react, oh my God, if I do it for this person, do does that open some floodgate that now every neighbor will be asking for something similar? Um, that was a misunderstanding of this key provision in the law that um, instances of requests for reasonable modifications to the way things are usually done are considered on an individual basis. Basic uh, proposition that ran across the operation of all departments in introducing the key to the ADA is flexible, responsive problem solving. Um, the fourth was to upgrade grievance procedures and to uh, and to formalize them. The fifth was, this is the Jeremy uh, provisions, snow removal, snow removal, snow removal, snow removal, providing access in severe weather conditions. Um, this is something that the city still has an awful lot of work um, um, to, to deal with and complicated issues because uh, questions have been raised um, by, for example, property owners um, who have bad backs and cannot otherwise meet some of the, the requirements in, in regulation for the clearing of sidewalks. There's a lot of work still to be done to be sure that we have improved accessibility throughout the year. Um, to improve parking, and in particular, the instance of the, the blockage of access routes and what was perceived as sometimes not sufficiently aggressive police enforcement of access requirements. Um, that was a concern that was brought to the Disability Commission frequently. Effective communication. This is the one I think that looms largest. A lot of what we've heard today has been about uh, physical access. I am thrilled to see a sign language interpreter and interpreters. For me personally, this is the first time, hallelujah, we have a large deaf population in this city. Um, the city's performance historically, I would say as a citizen no longer on the council has been egregious. Um, it's not only a matter of having sign language interpreters much more frequently being involved in public events. But that other related area, which is improvement for people who are hard of hearing, effective communication systems and amplification systems. It's addressed as a priority, but it has to be done not only in specific environments like the meeting rooms dedicated to the Disability Commission, but in all public meetings. Um, we could go on, there are many more. Focus on parks and recreation, um, accessible bathrooms and other. The, the transition plan though, and let me just conclude and say, it's a living document. It's about defining what are the most pressing issues now. So I certainly hope that the action of the city council and the role of the Disability Commission will be to take a deep look at what is in the transition plan to ask Keith to report on the areas of progress and work that's ongoing. But I'm adding one issue to this. We have been talking about um, access, uh, when access was blocked very often by cars and vehicles. What happened during the pandemic was increasingly in order to preserve the restaurants of the city was to provide reasonable flexibility in their using public walkways um, for um, 
for restaurant facilities. That now has to be looked at systemically um, because the temporary suspension of some access board requirements um, now has to be really addressed citywide. And it is best not to flood the access board with complaints, but to deal with the business interests of the town in a cooperative way between the city um, and the private businesses of the town. To simply say, we've come out of the pandemic, it is a, a new time and a fresh time to recommit to looking really seriously at improving accessibility. And I would say both the physical accessibility and the communications accessibility of the city. Thank you so much for that, Christos. Wonderful presentation. We're very, very grateful to you for all the work that you do for us. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Okay. Um. So we're over time. Um. We were we were scheduled to finish at seven thirty. It's seven thirty seven. Um. So we're hopefully hopefully we can get about th uh, three to seven minutes, three to seven minutes of uh, question and answer, something like that. Whatever people are okay with. Like if you have to go, that's fine. Um. So we'll just open it up now while we while we have some time. Um. Does anyone have any questions for any of the presenters? I'm looking Can for I raised hands. Okay. Oh, Amy. Hello. Hi, Jeff. Sorry, I did the unofficial raised hand. <laughs> uh, there was a question in the chat about an entrance fee to the DAR. I'm wondering if Meg would speak to that for a moment. Yes. Uh, so if you have a placard entrance to the any DCR property is for free um, and they charge entrance fees usually only in the summer for most properties. So uh, entrance fee and um, um, Indigenous Peoples Day. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, anybody have any other questions? Anybody else with questions? Feel free to ask. If you don't know who if you don't know who you want to ask, you can ask the entire panel of presenters if you want. Ben has his hand raised. Oh, sorry, I didn't see Ben. Sorry, that's um Thank I'm you. learning how to how to see all the people with their hands raised. Uh go, hello Ben. Yeah, I have a question for David Fenton um from Triad. And I was curious, I'm familiar with, um, I shouldn't say familiar, I know of vaguely the requipment um, medical, um, like donation distribution system. And triad was something I'd heard of, but didn't know much about. And I'm wondering what the differences are, when I should refer someone to one versus the other, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's uh, if it's in Hampshire County, you can refer them to us. If it's if it's a senior, um, and we just don't do beds. <laughs> That's the only thing I can tell you is we just don't do beds. They're they're very heavy. Um, storage is an issue, and uh, we just don't want to delve into that right now. Uh, liability, you know, you know, crashed into someone's house, their wall with a bed. Uh, there's an issue. So um, you can you can call us. The, the unique about new thing, unique thing about our program is that we deliver and we pick up, whether it be um, we're picking up a donation or we're picking up the, the item that we delivered out to someone three months ago when they were having their knee replaced or whatever the case may be. We deliver and we pick up. There are no fees. There's no hidden fees. There's no delivery fees. It's, it's the sheriff is really supportive of the sheriff. Kaylin has been a wonderful supporter. And uh, this this happened under his watch, and uh, we are moving it forward and, and serving the community. It's a it's a community policing, community service uh, of the sheriff's office and triad uh, in in total. Excellent, thank you, Amy. Uh, thanks. Um, I have. I wish we had more time because I have questions for all the panelists. Um, but uh, for CHD and All Out Adventures, 
I'm curious, what would you tell someone who might be nervous to attend a program who has never gone to one of your programs before? Um, what would you say to that person? I would tell them, come on down. Um, the, the way we set our program up is designed to be as inclusive as possible and also to be as not frightening as possible, I guess. I mean, we be, we're as supportive as we can possibly be to everybody that comes in to try out the programs. We have uh, one of our newest assistant coaches is actually a Paralympian, a kid named Kyle Zich. He won gold at the last Paralympics in sled hockey. So having that resource for us is invaluable because we have a guy who is at the pinnacle of the sport, but is back giving back to the programs. And he really goes out of his way to make the younger and the newer players feel welcome and to help them develop the skills a little bit quicker sometimes than they, they might have because he's just so good at what he does in a sled. It shortens up the learning curve quite a bit. And as, as I said, we don't want it to be scary or intimidating to everybody. We try to make them realize that this is a pathway to success, at least for us. We want this to be something that's going to make people stop saying I can't and start saying I can, and this is how I'm going to do it. And our, our goalie, Ben, is actually involved uh, in the chat as well. He might be able to add a little bit more. Um, ben? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Can yep. people hear me? Uh, yeah, uh, I think everybody should just come and check it out. And where the teams and everything are very welcoming to people, um, the coaches and at other programs, Jess and Ryan, they're very welcoming and attentive to people's needs and trying to accommodate uh, different areas, even when trying rock climbing, um, fishing, uh, all the other avenues. Uh, sled hockey is our biggest one, but the, they're very attentive to people's needs. Now, and I'll just jump in for Fallout Adventures to say similar to CHD, you know, we're, we're we really pay attention to creating a, a culture among our staff and the other participants that's really welcoming. Well um, if we understand for a lot of people, you know, it might be the first time they're venturing out, um, you know, to, to try one of these activities. We always invite people just to come by and visit and watch people uh, welcome questions. Um, and, you know, we, we go at whatever pace people want. So if somebody thinks they want to try and they come out and they decide they don't want to, like, that's okay. Um, you know, we're, we're here to make things possible for people to whatever degree they're comfortable with. Thank you so much. Any more questions from people? I have another one, but I'm hogging the question time. So um, I'll, I'll ask one question if that's okay. Great. Um, I had a question for uh, Meg Bandara. Um, you were I, you were talking about how. Um, Northampton has yet to have a to have a accessible trail, and um, and you know unfortunately like like I've I've you know, although I've been supportive over the years like I haven't known exactly how to help with that and now that I'm city councilor I was wondering if you could give me and just like the rest of the community advice on how could we eventually get a trail here in Northampton or like what could we do to to make to show support and make that happen. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think just continuing to bring the topic up with planning and sustainability, city officials, there's funding for the trail, there has been funding for the trail for years, um, asking for regular updates, just keeping the issue um, front and center because I think um, it's been a long time and we haven't really seen any movement that um, I'm aware of in years on the trail. So just continuing to ask about it, I think would be great. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Amy, would you like to ask an, another question? Is there anyone else who- Oh, oh yeah, if there's anyone else, sorry. Okay, I'm curious, Ben, if you, or it doesn't have to be you personally, but 
um, have any favorite books about disability um, or like a book that's regularly checked out, you know, that is popular um, or it can be one of your favorites, but any uh, any books during this Disability Pride Month that are you would recommend? Even more so than my personal favorites, I want to call out the fact that we have a great display right now of selections from our advisory board. Um, so it's one of the first things you see when you come in the library. We have a Disability Pride Month display with all selections from our advisory board. Um, that also can be found in our online catalog. Um, and um, yeah, there's some great things on it. I did put some things on it myself. I'm a great fan of the novel, What is Visible by Kimberly Elkins. Um, I also will do a shout out to the book um, Kissability by Catherine Duke, a local author um, and a friend of mine. Um, if I could give a, a plug for a book also, um, I don't know if the library carries it, but it's called Demystifying Disability by Emily Liddell. That's a great book. I recommend it if you don't have that. Has anybody read the book, The Gimp? By I Mark Lupin? I have not. Have it's either. actually a, a pretty good book. I read it. And uh, he goes into depths of uh, training for the Paralympics for uh, quad rugby and how he got over some of his injury stuff. It's actually a pretty good book. I read that one. Awesome. And um, Cindy just put in the chat uh, for children. It's called Just Ask by Sonia Sotomayor. Oh, wow. Thank you for that suggestion, Cindy. Any other questions? I have a question for um, Carmen Rosado from Stavros, if, if that's okay. Um, you had mentioned um, funding, finding funding for ramps. And I was curious, is that is that for just like individual, like for um, like finding a ramp for someone for your housing, for your house, or is it also for like businesses and things like that? I'm just curious, like, I'm just curious, like who, who that is for and also like um, the process that, that you go through. Thanks. One second. No problem. Okay. Um, so the ramps are built for um, our consumers who have physical disabilities, who had been stuck either in their houses or nursing homes, coming out of the nursing homes. And the program is a nonprofit program, so we need uh, resources and money to build those ramps. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. It doesn't matter the age. Um, if the person qualifies to get a ram, they might pay a little portion of the ram, but it's not like a humongous amount of money to spend. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Really welcome. Thank you. Jeremy, I'll, I'll just add that there are tax incentives available to businesses to become accessible. Um, I can't cite the provision uh, of the tax code off the top of my head, but uh, but I know they're out there. So businesses, you know, should talk to their accountants or, or look into that if, if they're doing accessibility upgrades. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, Jacob Drew? Hi, th thank you to all the amazing presenters. This has been invaluable. I, I just wanted to follow up on this thread. Um, what, what are the sort of the levers that can be pulled? And this is for anyone who might know, um, for forcing um, places that are open to the public to become accessible. Um, are there levers that can be pulled uh, legally um, 
And um, how do we, you know, what, what what recommendations are there for advocating to get more um, access and 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 to force the issue? Uh, it feels like um, I've been I've been lurking on the disability commission meetings for a while, and it, and it feels like this is something that's been hanging around for a bit. And um, you know, as as a parent of a, a child who uses a, a wheelchair, it's um, you know something that I want to I want to force as quickly as possible. So I'm, I'm curious what what levers are available to us. Feel free anybody to answer that. Anyone that wants to speak up. I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think it depends on um, on the entity that you're that you're talking about on, on the, the if it's a business, if it's a private private business or if it's a public entity. Um, so, you know, I mean, th there's I mean, the ADA right now is, is probably the, the you know, the, the strongest lever, if you will. Um, but the Architectural Access Board also um, really you know, do, does great work. I, I think William Joyce jumped off, but um, uh, you know, a lot of it just depends on jurisdiction and, and when you're talking about architectural accessibility, some of that is somewhat dependent on when the building was built or if it was recently upgraded or renovated in some way. Um, and if you're talking about public buildings or the, or the public right of way, um, the rules are a little bit different, um, but, um, and, and also somewhat dependent on, you know, the, the, the area of the city or town. Um, where where the where the location is, um, and that there are you know there are priorities around government buildings, schools, uh, hospitals, um, business districts, uh, things like that. Um, so there's you know there can be sort of a hierarchy in terms of upgrading um, accessibility in, in in the public right of way. Um, I mean I think the best the best tool you know generally is 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 the public um, putting it front and center and and going directly to Either the governmental entity that's that's involved, or or the business that's involved, and um, and and starting from there. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else want to either ask a question or expand upon that last question? Uh, there is training with the MAAB, Jacob, for residents of Massachusetts um, and it's on their website, um, but I can also, since I know your email address, I can send you information about that if you don't know about it. But just so everyone knows, there is a fantastic training, two levels of training for community members. Thank you, Amy. And and for, um, for those that, um, that may have noticed, there's a wheelchair lift being built at 41 on at, uh, as an addition to the building at 41 Strong Avenue, and that was done um, with the collaboration of the M the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board, and also with the Disability Law Center. So that's a great example of, of the work that they can get done here in Northampton. Other questions. Um, Christos, I was wondering if you could um, maybe talk a little bit about the sidewalks in Northampton, and um, I was wondering if you're aware of the sidewalk inventory, and just curious what you think about it, and um, like how we could, if you have any ideas about how we could um, focus more on the sidewalks in Northampton, because oftentimes they, they seem like side projects to other projects, and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on just like how we could have you know have more highlights on the sidewalks thanks it, uh, yeah. before christos jumps in i just want to note the time it is 7 .55, okay and trudy has been interpreting for over an hour and a half okay and okay we had, we had two interpreters this is a two-person job so uh and gotcha sidewalks are a huge can of worms so uh, yeah well yeah I, that's true um well, maybe like, uh, what do you, would you would you like to end it maybe in five a few minutes, Keith, or what are you thinking? Uh, yeah, I just want to be respectful of everyone's time, uh, especially Trudy, who's who's uh, doing double duty. Uh, but also, uh, this is Q and A, so um, you know, uh, this question specifically, 
um, that Chris could summarize in a minute or two. Uh, but I do want to recognize everyone's time. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, Chris, just giving us a quick answer to the best he can. Yeah. Um, it's one of the difficulties of living in New England. And I think the inventory of sidewalks is really a critical piece of it, um, reviewing all of that information and seeing what the priorities are. But I, I think it's to have an open process where people are really looking at the, the access routes that concern them and see if it is reflected in the order of priorities that's being established. Um, we aren't going to get huge additional funding at any point in the future. So it's to see that the funding that does go in um, is targeted and prioritized as effectively. And then the other side of it was to deal with emergency situations. And that's a place where I think the city's ass has to be kicked a lot harder because there have been dangerous situations that in the past the city has not effectively responded to. They have to prove that their performance is improved. And a member of the Disability Commission is probably the person whose life story reflects this, Emma. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Christos. Do you mind if I jump in and, and just wrap up and say thank you to everyone? Sounds Dunn? great. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, everybody. Right, thanks. Yeah, thank you all so very much for being here this evening. And thanks for your flexibility with going over a little bit in our time so that we could hear from everybody and have time for some questions. So thank you so much panelists for the work you're doing in our community. Um, and thank you so much for the folks who attended and are continuing this conversation. And I hope everyone found this useful and helpful and um stay dry i don't know about you all but now the thunder is right over us so hope you all have a great rest of your night and a happy disability pride month thank you all thank you trudy thanks everyone have a great night thank, thank you all thanks, you know